tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 17. I'm your host, Otis Gyre, and in this episode, I'll be performing four spine-chilling tales for you, all of them from author Michael Whitehouse, about self-righteous rebellion, eerie auditions, cryptic cultures, and dark descents. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first three terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors. Turn your lights down low and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight from author Michael Whitehouse introduces us to a gentleman who relishes fighting back against a world coming undone, who would gladly give the world a bloody nose and let it know it's been in a fight even if it means nothingness, and he may have just his chance. Without further ado, I present to you Good Vibrations. The screams were the hardest part, standing on the dust-covered hill looking down to the container in the darkness. The cries rose up through the air like a sea of Chinese lanterns, ready to be extinguished. They did not bring light, only grief. For Larry, this was part of the job. He didn't like it, but he'd long since forgotten the guilt. Jesse, on the other hand, was green. It usually took five or six times to settle into the job and accept the death for the greater good mantra. But Jesse was only 28 years old and two offerings in, so her hands were shaking as she held the remote trigger overlooking the valley below. "'You want me to press it?' Larry said, his open palm upturned to the black sky above. Jessie shook her head, her curled blonde hair quivering with nerves. She still had a gleam in her eye, but Larry knew that would fade soon enough. You couldn't kill so easily with the fire of hope still burning. "'Suit yourself.' Larry held a pair of black night-vision goggles to his eyes to see if there was any sign, but there wasn't. He cut a grim figure up there, waiting for the carnage to begin, his stern gaze comfortably at home against the vast of night. "'What's taking so long?' whispered Jesse. "'There's no need to whisper up here, Jess. They'll never hear you. Not over the bait.' Was that what it had come to, referring to humans as bait? Larry wasn't sure when he stopped caring. 
But labeling them something other than people sure made the job go down easier. Putting his hand into the right pocket of his black combat trousers, he pulled out a piece of chewing gum and threw it in his mouth. His jaw clicked with each bite, a result of having it broken during a bar fight when he was 18. Soon after, he found God. Now, he was in his 40s, often wondering what his younger self would think about the thousands of people he'd led to their deaths. Would young Larry have understood... Probably not. But older Larry satisfied these quandaries by telling himself that time shapes morality, and only God creates time. That was a seal of divine approval. The night air was cool, but not cold. It was one of those autumn nights caught in the crack between summer and the falling of leaves. How Larry wished there were actual leaves to kick his feet through like he'd done when he was a kid. But you needed trees for that. You needed life in order for it to perish. And that was something that was in short supply. It didn't take this long before. Larry could hear the impatience in Jesse's voice and something else. Fear, perhaps. Some of the colleagues he'd worked with never quite got over that, the desire for the night to end. Bring out the living. Let the talons of night come. Just hope that the sacrifice would be enough to see the dawn. The dark blue container down in the valley was once used to ship goods from continent to continent when the world was whole. Now the container was merely a receptacle for what Larry's bosses called the greatest gift. One of Larry's co-workers once joked that he and the others were like Santa handing out just what the bleak ones wanted, except instead of every year, it was every month. And there was much more at stake than the disappointment of not getting what you wanted in your stocking. A flicker of red and yellow poked up from the bottom of the desolate valley. To the naked eye, this couldn't be seen, but in Larry and Jesse's standard-issue night vision goggles, the yellow-red hue was unmistakable, against the pitch-black night. No one could agree on why they gave off heat just before each feast. Some scientists speculated they had a kind of spiritual metabolism that had to be fired up like a furnace before they ate at night. Others thought it was a form of ceremony, letting the ordained watchers know that the horror was about to unfold and that they were conspirators with the abyss. Larry didn't care for any of that. They were evil, no doubt. But as long as he kept them fed, things would stay as they were. That was all that mattered. He and the rest of the priesthood were holding the door of night closed. If they failed, only death and abomination would rule. He couldn't let that happen, even if the cost was so high. Young Larry would have railed against the injustice of it all. He would have taken oblivion any day over being part of the orderly offering up of human life. But older Larry had long since had that notion worn out of him. One day he woke up and only cared about saving what was left, not any higher pursuit of morality or justice. Those were luxuries that a weary world could no longer afford. Jesse and Larry both watched through their black goggles as the red shapes moved toward the large sealed shipping container in the valley, a sea of clamoring horrors ready to devour the light of each soul. From the outline of each, it was difficult to know exactly what they looked like or what shape they took. The impression from the heat signatures was of something that shifted from all fours to two and back again, something neither beast nor human, but with an intelligence eclipsing both. There was the suggestion of large talons or claws, and perhaps a protrusion from the face, if it could be called one. But the truth was no one knew what they looked like, only that they arrived ten years previous and began to consume the light of all who lived. They'd come at night, slithering upward from the void that hid out of the sight between the cracks of reality. Governments tried to end them by scorching the earth's crust, 
But that did nothing except make them more at home. No weapon of humankind could defeat the darkness. They were not composed of matter. They came from a place where ideas reign, and they themselves were forged from the fallen one who was banished there, who had whispered with its last breath an idea so abhorrent and so unnatural that it had slowly bred a festering mass of unthinkable anti-life, feeding on the immortal light which resides in us all. At least that's what the church had taught. Some of it was a tough sell for Larry at first, but over time he'd come to rely on his faith as the only anchor he had left, and so he gave himself up to it heart and soul. As each pocket of humanity had fled into deep caverns underground, it was only a matter of time before the bleak ones sniffed them out, too. That was until some twisted bright spark realized that they could be temporarily sated. And the cost? Eighty-six human souls each and every month. Young Larry would have run down there to help those people, pull them out of the container and hope that somehow they'd make it out alive. But older Larry? No. He couldn't take that risk. Age had brought with it a cold distance from humanity, and an even colder insistence on believing every word his superiors said. Things were now moving at a pace in the valley below, as the sharpened blobs of red and yellow ride on the dark green display of Larry's night vision goggles. The stampeding mass reached the sealed door of the container. It was then a rumble from the valley, not an audible one, by the feeling of one's insides vibrating. Larry could feel his intestines, liver, and heart shake violently. He hated this part. It felt like his organs would be sucked out of his mouth if the sensation were allowed to escalate. And indeed they would have been, but the vibration wouldn't be allowed to grow. Not on Larry's watch. That was what the bait was for. Jesse, hit it. The vibration within continued to increase. Now Larry could feel his windpipe rattling in his throat. He tensed up, the door to the container still closed. Jesse! Larry turned to his young associate and saw the look in her eyes, wide and afraid. Something was very wrong. Jesse, press it! But Jesse didn't respond. She just held her throat as the vibration began to choke her. Unlike Larry, she wasn't fighting it. They'd been taught to tense their bodies like old fighter pilots used to when resisting G-force. This was a fight to stay awake and alive. It would buy you a little time. But Jessie wasn't trying. She was letting the vibration scramble her insides. Reaching out, Larry grabbed the trigger from Jessie's shaking hands. He released the yellow safety catch and flicked the golden switch underneath. Nothing. Only the vibration, and now the escalating screams of those stuck inside the unopened container. Larry flipped the switch again back and forward. The door remained tightly sealed. I'm sorry, Larry, Jesse whispered. A cold chill fingered its way up Larry's spine. Dear God, he said out loud, not caring for the blaspheme. Jessie let out a gasp as her body convulsed. As she fell to the ground, Larry caught her in his arms. She looked up at him and smiled. Jessie, how do I fix this? Again she smiled. Larry moved his hands toward the radio handset, attached to his hip, but Jessie shook her head. No, Larry, the backup team is in on it, too. Why? God damn it, why? I joined the priesthood to protect people, not throw them to the dark. And so did you. She coughed up blood that spilled out over her bottom lip and down her chin. If they don't get their sacrifice, then what? Larry squeezed his muscles, resisting the increasing pain of the vibration. Then, Jesse coughed again. If there is a God... He'll receive us happily for our refusal to throw his children to the darkness like garbage. Jesse, 
There must be another way. Larry began shaking her violently. She smiled yet again, but this time the smile stuck. Jesse's last conscious act was to reach out and grab Larry's white priest collar, tearing it from around his neck. Her body then shook violently as the vibration took her. Larry scrambled away and looked back in horror as the vibration twisted Jesse's bones and insides. Her body snapped in the middle and began folding in on itself. Her head, neck, and arms were then pulled inward until there was no more than a garbled collection of human parts, thrust together like she'd been in a trash compactor. He swore blind she was still smiling. Pulling himself to his feet, Larry could now feel the vibration reaching his eyes. The fluid inside was sloshing around and he could feel the pressure increasing. Even with his training, he couldn't survive this as long as the vibration continued. There was no other option for him or for humanity. He had to satisfy the bleak ones or they would come for what little remained. Larry rushed down the hillside, stumbling, clambering, almost an inhuman mess himself. At times, it was as though he were on all fours, a beast insatiable with one desire, the manual release. He thought his blood vessels in his face began to weep through his skin. He'd never been so close to the bleak ones before, to the talons of night. They were writhing around on top of each other, their red-yellow forms pulsating and shifting in Larry's goggles. With each step, he neared them, and they grew larger. Larry didn't know if this was because he was getting closer or because they were surging from the vibration, contorting and shifting in size. Something cracked in the back of Larry's skull. He felt the sensation of warm blood trickling down inside his neck, and yet he continued running, continued moving toward the container with every inch of will he had left within him. The bleak ones now moved off the sealed container and were no longer paying the bait any attention. They were distracted by the gray, bloodied figure of a disheveled priest, finally making it to the flat of the valley, charging towards them. Larry felt a tear in his abdomen. Something was leaking inside. It felt like being shot in the guts, and he imagined that his intestines were now cut open, spewing forth their poison and waste throughout his body. And yet he continued... Young Larry would have been proud. The bleak ones moved toward him, but they did not tear or bite. Instead, they emitted a strange sound, as though they were laughing at this pathetic morsel of humanity, this pathetic man of a religion that had abandoned him and the world itself. Larry's Achilles tendon ruptured, and he felt the tendon rattle up inside his right leg like a snap piece of tensed elastic. He fell to the ground and dragged himself along the cold dust that had once been grass. The bleak ones surrounded him, but just as he thought they were about to tear his skin from him, they parted, leaving a channel of escape directly to the shipping container. He looked around carefully at the silence, now only inches from the talons of the night, sharp and curved, ready to disembowel, but not moving the great vibration still tearing his innards apart. They want the sacrifice, he thought. Reaching out, Larry's hand touched the cold metal of the shipping container, and he pulled himself up onto his one working leg. The vibration continued, and it was then that his left eye burst open. He would have screamed if his tongue hadn't now swollen to such a size that it almost blocked his airway. In all the pain, in that well of agony, Larry, the priest, reached up and felt the manual release lever at the door of the container. With all the strength that was left in him, he pulled it, and then the door opened. It pulled back to reveal eighty-six cowering people, mostly the old and infirm. They were gaunt and frightened, and they looked at Larry's bleeding face with the hope that he would help them. They begged for mercy, their wide eyes haunting and utterly desperate. Larry had never seen the bait in all the years he'd been offering them up as sacrifice. 
They'd always been loaded in before he turned up for his shift. That had always made it easier to not see those pleading faces, to not see their agony. Out of sight, out of mind, and with such distance, Larry had been able to remove their humanity somehow from his guilt. But now that illusion was banished. In those expressions, those wild cries for mercy, something stirred in Larry, something that he had abandoned in himself for many years, a fragment of that 18-year-old kid who had his jaw broken long ago in a bar fight, the man who wouldn't take anything the world gave lying down, the one who relished fighting back against the world coming undone. He would give the world a bloody nose and let it know it had been in a fight, even if it meant nothingness. As the bleak ones readied themselves to feed, their furnaces inside firing up once more, Larry, the priest, pushed the lever up. The doors of the container closed once more, sealing the people inside away from the monstrosities which surrounded them. Larry then turned and said something before feeling his very soul being torn from his body, one vein at a time. If anyone had been there to bear witness, if any greater power was indeed watching from upon high, they would not have been able to make the words out from between Larry's now shattering teeth. Whatever he said, it was filled with defiance against God, against the Blake Ones, against it all. And in that moment, humanity showed its worth. I hope you enjoyed Good Vibrations, as written by Michael Whitehouse and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the first story, please show the author your support by visiting his profile today, where you'll find links to his books for sale on Amazon, his social media, and his latest project, a horror audio podcast of his own, featuring the talented Peter Lewis, called Fear Noir. Fear Noir is, as Michael puts it, a collection of hard-boiled detective stories with a slug of whiskey and a belt of nightmare fuel. So if that's your thing, what have you got to lose? Check it out today. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash whitehouse. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash whitehouse, spelled exactly how it sounds, and you'll be redirected to Michael's profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com. From there, just click any of the links at the top of the page to get in touch with Michael or to subscribe to his podcast today. Or just visit www.fearnoir.com. You can also find the Fear Noir podcast on Apple Podcasts and wherever else your favorite shows can be found. And if you check out Mike's books or podcast, be sure to leave a review and a kind word and let the author know you heard about him here on this show. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Up next, we've got a second tale of terror for you, courtesy once again of Michael Whitehouse. In it, we'll meet would-be rock star Matt and his band, who are about to receive a call that will change their lives forever. Will they finally get that big break? Or does the mysterious mogul courting them have something else in mind? Stay tuned and find out. Without further ado, I present to you, Play It Again. Throw another log in the fire. That'll keep us warm for a while. Keep the darkness at bay. Perhaps we should pass the time with another story by the campfire just long enough to see us through past midnight. I've told you stories before of ancient evils lurking in the woods which surround us, a malevolence that reaches out from the distant past to touch us here, in the present. But we needn't delve into an obscure history of vengeful spirits or abhorrent monstrosities to find that these woods contain their fair share of secrets. 
A macabre fate may make itself known even in these technological modern times. Take, for example, what happened not far from here just three years ago. Now, fame and fortune are things that fuel our creative heart. And at no time in our lives is that desire for the crowd, for an audience, more potent than during the rocky road of our teenage years. Many take to the guitar, the drums, the bass, or a keyboard, but whatever the chosen instrument, music provides an intoxicating creative outlet for the parts of us which craves attention. The skills we learn, the songs we sing, surely they will lead us to stardom and glory. In our naivety, we assume this is our right. It's only a matter of time before we succeed, before the world learns how special we are. But when those teenage years pass, and fame and fortune have proven more elusive than once thought, a quiet desperation slowly sets in. A fervent desire to hold on to youth, hoping that your band, your music, all your talent will receive that magical piece of good fortune that will propel you toward your dreams. Your twenties roll by, but you still feel young enough to be snapped up by a record company. Jobs, partners, hobbies, they're all just distractions from what you were put on earth to do. Then your thirties come, and age begins to present a problem, for the music industry is littered with talented acts, but most of them come to fruition when they are teenagers, or in their twenties at best. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule, but they only prove that it exists. Sleepless nights and growing dread wash over you, as a voice inside your mind whispers, Time is running out. A few towns over from where we are now, one such band was struggling with this fact of life, the unerring flow of time. Its lead singer and leader was a man called Matt. He had always talked big to the other three members of the group and had managed to keep them hopeful of one day landing a big, fat record deal complete with adoring groupies and mountains of cash. Tommy was on bass, Jackson on the drums, and Freddie on the guitar. Up until that time, it all seemed so simple, so right. When they were teenagers playing gigs, their friends and a small fan base would cheer them on to unavoidable greatness. Heady days indeed. But in the end, the fruit of their efforts withered replaced only by a malignant doubt and failure which clawed within. The good times were well and truly over. But Matt was not quite ready to let the dream die. At 35, he still felt he had something relevant to say to the world, and believed with every inch of his being that he and his band would soon reach their goal, a goal which he had continuously pledged to the other members for 20 years, being just around the corner. Money was the real problem, to keep the band going until they made it big. For a long time, they had a decent local following, so could play gigs and make just enough to scrape by. But even those faithful followers had now moved on to other things, to other chapters of their lives. And the music the band played, while enjoyable, was mired in the fashions of two decades previous. The future was looking bleak. That was, until one day Matt received a letter. It read as follows. Dear Matt, I've been a fan of your band for some time, and have been to several of your live shows. I'm sure you've noticed, however, that your fan base has dwindled recently. Luckily, I have found myself in a privileged situation. I've recently come into a large inheritance, and I want to set up my own record company. I'd very much like for you and your band to be our first singers. This would involve a record contract for three albums over the next three years and a small promotional tour. If this is something that you're interested in, please contact me on the following cell number. Sincerely, 
a devoted fan. Well, Matt was delighted at this offer, and as quick as he had read the letter, he had dialed the enclosed number and spoke with this devoted fan. His name was Harry Schofield, and he seemed to be the real deal. He was willing to invest over a million dollars in the band, with 500K of that being split between the four band members. You can imagine how happy this made Matt. Finally, after all those years of struggling, it was really happening. All those gigs, all those songs, all that heartbreak. Now he had finally shown the doubters that they were wrong. But as Harry Schofield continued on the phone, it became apparent that there was one stumbling block. As it turned out, Harry was only a part owner of this new record company. His older brother, Thomas, had to sign off on the deal before it could go through. Harry referred to Thomas as unusually careful with his business and that the only way he would allow Matt's band to be signed would be if they auditioned for him. If it went well, then they would receive a concrete record contract within days. And so an audition was set up for the band. But it was an unusual one. Matt, Tommy, Jackson, and Freddie were to go to Thomas's house and audition personally for him. When Matt learned that his house was in the very woods which surround us, deep in the southern portion, he began to grow a little uneasy. He and the band worried that it was some sort of joke. Auditions were usually held at a venue or a practice studio, but here the band was being asked to venture deep into an isolated area so that they could be evaluated by someone they had never met face-to-face, even spoken to, in fact. After several phone calls to Harry, these issues were reduced to a degree when, as a token of goodwill, he deposited 400,000 pounds into their bank accounts as an audition fee. At the sight of this money, the band knew that Harry, Thomas, and this new record company were the real deal. Who would pay that sort of money if they weren't taking the process seriously. And so the day came for the audition, and Matt and the boys drove out through these very woods. And finally, after an hour or so of wrong turns and nervous glances at each other, they found the house. It was impressive. The band had expected nothing more than a log cabin. But there, in front of them, in a large clearing, the house sat, two stories tall, with a well-groomed lawn and clean, maintained gray stonework, as well as a large wooden porch out front. It was Freddy, the guitar player, who found the note. A piece of paper lodged in a plant pot at the front door. He opened it and read it aloud to his fellow band members. Hey guys, unfortunately Thomas is busy today, but we've organized a compromise. Please make yourself at home. You'll notice we've set up a few cameras inside. Thomas has left strict instructions that you should switch all the cameras on, then play your best 30-minute set. Give it everything you've got, as Thomas is very particular, about the act he wants to sign. He'll be watching remotely, and should he wish to contact you, he'll give you a ring. Please do follow all his instructions, as I dearly want to sign you guys to the new label, but I can't do it if Thomas doesn't agree. Thanks much, and good luck with the audition. Sincerely, Harry. P.S. The door is open. Freddy thought this was a bizarre turn of affairs, and the others agreed. They had all thought they were there to play in front of Thomas, only now to find themselves performing for a camera. When they went inside, they found everything just as Harry had described. There were three cameras on tripods, staring vacantly at an empty space against one of the walls in the living room. Other than that, the place looked like a holiday home, with a corner couch, TV, and a large bookcase to the rear. The setup seemed a bit over the top, but Matt and the others were desperate for the contract to go through, and so they agreed to give it their all. They also agreed outside that they would not say anything else about the strangeness of the situation near those cameras, as the feeling was that Thomas was watching, and they didn't want to offend him and ruin the deal. And so, as per the instructions, Matt and his band set up their instruments and played. 
They played their hearts out, as if performing for a crowd of 50,000. Finally, when the 30-minute set was over, they put their instruments down, packed everything up, and left the house. But as they walked toward the car, a ringing now came from inside the house. A phone. Must be Thomas, Matt said to the group, and then rushed inside to answer. Freddie, the guitar player, went with him, and so they picked up the telephone inside the house, and they both listened over the receiver. After a crackle in the line, a voice soon came, thin and croaked. Matt thought it reminded him of something, maybe from an old black-and-white film, as if speaking out of time. It was the cadence, the intonation, the music to the voice. It was somber, like a funeral march, yet it spoke very plainly. The voice said, I'm Thomas. Play it again. Matt and Freddy didn't know what to make of it. They asked which song Thomas would like to hear. But the reply did not answer this, though it did come swiftly. Play it again, the voice said. Then the line went dead as if Thomas had hung up. Freddy figured that Thomas meant the entire set, and Matt didn't want to miss the song Thomas liked the most, so it seemed sensible to play the entire 30 minutes all the way through once more. And so, begrudgingly, the band set up their equipment in the empty space of the living room once more. Then they performed. Matt sang his heart out, Freddie played note perfect, and the thumping bass of Tommy was driven forward, hopefully, by Jackson's perfect timing on the drums. At the end of the 30-minute set, they all stopped and looked at each other, wondering what would happen now. If that was it, and if they should now head home and wait for the outcome. The phone rang loudly. Once more, Freddy and Matt listened in. They asked the somber voice on the other end of the line what it thought, but all it said was, play it again. Confused and a little dejected with their efforts, not being good enough, the band nonetheless pushed onward and played again. They thrashed through the songs, music they'd all written over the course of two decades. Their best, their brightest, their catchiest, their big hits, as Matt referred to them. When they finished, they were covered in sweat and exhausted, for now they'd played an hour and thirty minutes of music and were starting to feel the strain. Feeling now that they had surely done their best to win Thomas over, they were shocked when the phone rang and that thin, croaked voice stated plainly, Play it again. This time, Freddy started talking, almost refusing, saying that he could not see what good it would do, that they'd put everything into it already. There was silence, the slightest crackle on the line, and then the voice spoke. Play it again, before hanging up. Freddy started questioning Matt about the entire thing, wondering if it was all some horrible practical joke. But Matt was as puzzled as he was, though not willing to give up just yet. Let's do it once more. This could be our last chance at the big time. There was a desperation creeping into his voice, a sound which spoke of fear, a creeping disappointment that the dreams were once more to be dashed, perhaps forever. Matt was a good leader, and he always was able to energize the band when they were feeling despondent. He had had two decades of practice at that, all those conversations of quitting, of ending the band only to pull it back from the brink each time with a smile and a resolute belief. He managed it on that day, too, and so they played again, again with heart, again with everything they had, and again, by the end of the performance, they were utterly exhausted. They waited. The silence was overwhelming. The only sounds, the distant call of some unseen bird, deep within the woods outside. The atmosphere felt charged, like the breath before an oncoming storm. Anticipation has its way of sucking the life from the moment. But the phone did not ring this time. It sat there, silent. The band members remained for a time, too tired to talk. 
Finally, Freddy suggested that perhaps Thomas and Harry were talking it over and that that was why no one had called to let them know yet. But after an hour passed, they had lost their patience. It would be dark soon, and none of them fancied staying the night in a remote house out in the woods. Even as they stood there, the sky was graying above, promising to snuff out the light sooner rather than later. And so, feeling dejected, they packed up their instruments and decided to head home. But just as they did so, Freddy had an inclination. He picked up the phone to see if he could dial out and get the phone number of the last caller. If they were going to waste the band's time like that and get their hopes up, then he had to give them a few choice words to take with him. But when he picked up the receiver and tried to dial out, he realized there was no dial tone. It was as though the phone line had been disconnected. Silence met his ear, and then a sound. The stillness was briefly, subtly broken. On the other end of the line, a mouth breathed shallowly. Yes, Freddy was certain of it. Thomas had never hung up. In fact, he was now sitting with his mouth to the receiver for some reason, close and present. The breaths moved in and out with a rhythm of their own, but there was a quiver within, a sort of nervousness which sounded remarkably like twisted excitement. Matt listened, then Tommy, then Jackson. Matt spoke several times, but the breaths continued, and at no point did they break into voice. They stared at the cameras, which still pointed at him, and Jackson observed that perhaps Thomas was watching them, on the cameras as they tried to engage with him over the phone. Somewhere out there, a wide-open eye accompanied that stuttering breath. The band members became so unsettled by this that they quickly got into their cars and drove through the forest. The trees passed, the dark pockets therein, which have seen countless people come and go, come and go, come and go. Matt began to feel as though the forest had gobbled them up from the modern world, only finally to be greeted by the last wisps of sunlight as they broke through the forest's boundaries and then to a busy road and home. You will not be surprised to learn that they never heard from Harry or Thomas ever again. No emails, no phone calls, and when Matt made some inquiries about the mobile phone number Harry given them, the police informed them that that phone had been stolen and that the real owner was a woman. Now, you'd be forgiven for simply thinking this is a strange tale, unusual but nothing more. Alas, that is not the way of such things as these. One week after their bizarre audition, Matt organized a band meeting to discuss how they'd move forward. Tommy arrived, as did Jackson the drummer, and Freddie, but not Matt himself. No, Matt did not attend the meeting he had set and he did not call or text as to why. He wouldn't answer his phone or message on social media. And when the band drove down to his house and knocked on the front door, no one answered, for Matt lived alone. Eventually, Freddie and the rest worried that Matt had gotten drunk and fallen or hurt himself somehow in his home. After much persuasion, the police decided to act and broke into the house. The other band members were there when they did so, and they feared what they would find. But there was no stench of death, as one might have feared, no sign of a struggle, no sign of anything untoward. That was until the two things. The first was that Matt had vanished, taking with him only the guitar on which he had written many of the band's songs, leaving behind his dreams of being a famous musician with his band, Abandoning such pursuits, and to my knowledge, no one has seen or heard from him again. The second troubling find was a small piece of paper left on the pillow of Matt's bed. It read, I like this one best. He can keep playing. I hope you enjoyed Play It Again by author Michael Whitehouse, as performed by yours truly. 
Up next, we've got a third dose of darkness for you, once again from Mr. Whitehouse. In it, a researcher travels to an island to learn everything he can about a people and their language, lost long ago to the hands of time. <laughs> yeah. Or are they? <laughs> Without further ado, I present to you the people of the sea. A legend says that on the wind of the North Atlantic, there's carried a key to a strange land, a place of unequaled beauty and unparalleled nightmare. For too long I thought those stories the product of whimsical minds, lazy lips, espousing wishful dreams about what truly lies beyond the horizon. Now I know that, like most legends, a seed of truth has long been planted in the cultural memory of our ancestors. Some intrepid soul had once entered that forbidden land, perhaps more than once. It just so happens that I am the most recent guest, invited or kidnapped, choose, whichever suits your interpretation. It was the Isle of Lewis off the northeast coast of Scotland where I first encountered that land. Lewis is in the far corner of the United Kingdom and with its sprawling grassy lowlands faces the oncoming winds from the Atlantic. Seas swell, tides beat against the rocky shore and the people who inhabit this part of the world are rugged, kind, and stoic. Unfortunately, my contact with the people there lasted only a few days. After a scenic stay in Moore's Gale House, I traveled by car and then boat across the water to Little Benera. This remote island is uninhabited, perhaps the reason that its secrets have remained hidden for so long. No permanent population has lived there since the 1800s, but evidence for its original inhabitants reaches far back into the mists of time. Forgotten peoples with equally forgotten beliefs and, dare I say, sciences. What brought me to the island was my research. I was working on a thesis for my Ph.D. at Strathclyde University, one I hoped would forge my name in the annals of British and Scottish archaeology. Most of the ancient languages of Scotland were long forgotten. The cultures of those people who, thousands of years ago, had once roamed the mountains, glens, and islands of that mysterious country had always held a fascination for me. I wish I'd never developed that fascination, for it has led me into the most frightening of places. I will not bore you with my academic work any further. Time is short. Suffice to say, I developed a theory that, much like several islands which had sunk into the Mediterranean, ancient stories suggested that at one time a large piece of land had collapsed into the dark, abysmal sea off the coast of Scotland, taking with it an entire people and its culture. This theory was roundly discredited and mocked by my colleagues. Nonetheless, there were tantalizing fragments of knowledge suggesting this was a reality. Allusions in ancient texts, depictions of a calamity carved in rock, and even an old folktale about Deon ans a Muir, the rough translation of which is The People of the Sea. With arduous research, I discovered that the Isle of Lewis was most likely the closest place to where this mysterious land had fallen. Furthermore, that little Bernera was intimately connected with the legend of the sea people and what befell them. This uninhabited island sat in the mouth of a huge sea lock. My research suggested that when the sea people and their land fell into the dark swells of the North Atlantic, one of its survivors washed up on the shores of Little Bernera eons ago. I'm proficient in sailing and hired a small fishing boat for three days, all that my research budget would allow me. As I approached Little Bernera breathing in the sea air, I marveled at its beauty. 
an arching bay filled with sand and pebbles welcomed me as I tied my boat to an old weathered mooring. The wind carried itself across the landscape, covering the surroundings in a sharp, salted scent. On a hill nearby was the only standing building, an old slated fish curing, where the local fishermen once processed their catch. But it was not this structure which was the focus of my research. No, it was to the many headstones that dotted the hills as they rose and dipped around me. You see, little Benera has another secret. The entire island is a graveyard. The crofting town of Carloway used the island as a burial ground until its residents finally created their own cemetery nearby. They would cross the water and bury their dead in the soil, marking the site with a headstone. Looking around at the windswept low-lying hills and rocks that looked out to the infinite depths of the sea, I understood why such a place could be seen as an entryway into the afterlife. I walked up a steeper incline, compass and map in hand, following my notes to a place I dreamed of, the Keystone. This headstone was different from the others, as it hid something precious beneath it. I had followed the trails of breadcrumbs and spoke to someone who knew of its location, perhaps the only person still alive who understood its importance. His name was Gil Haven. His family had long protected a secret. It was rumored that they were descended from a local elder who was among the people who found the survivor of the calamity on their shores. Ever since, the family has kept hidden evidence of that survivor, now interred beneath a fake gravestone. Gil Haben, by this time an alcoholic, had no love for his family's duties and was quite happy to spill the beans on the grave's location for a few hundred pounds. I obliged in paying, and the information he gave me led to that very spot on the windswept soil and rock of Little Bernera. As I reached the crest of the hill, I saw that it dipped down on the other side by several feet. At the bottom of that depression, there was a hole in the ground, cast in shadow away from the sun, which was now beginning to dip in the sky. My heart sank at what I saw. I leapt down the hill to take a closer look. The hole was there, all right, just big enough for someone to slip inside, but I feared that what was underground had been disturbed. Taking out a torch, I shone it into the darkness and could see that the headstone now lay broken on the floor about fifteen feet beyond the opening. Had a competitor gotten there before me, or had the grave simply caved in? In any case, I had intended to discover what relics the grave hid, and I was enthralled by what appeared to be an underground tomb beneath the grassy depression. I'd come prepared for a subterranean sojourn, as the old stories had suggested, I might find such a place. Indeed, my supplies would allow me to stay on the island for several days, packed away in my trusted backpack, which had accompanied me on many an adventure. Alongside my sample containers, and a good book to read by the fire at night. With some rope tied to another headstone, I lowered myself into the darkness. As I descended from the world above, the air changed immediately. No longer was there a sharp, fresh smell from the sea rolling over grass and rock. This was replaced by a musty scent, like rotten compost. Ancient roots weaved in and out of the soil around me as I descended. The trees, which had once given birth to them, long since removed from the hillside. When I reached the bottom of the hole, I could see the grave broken on the ground, though the writing was barely legible. The Haven family had placed the gravestone over the entry point over 200 years previous to market, though my research suggested that the cave beneath and what it contained was much, much older. I speculated that the gravestone had been erected because the family commitment to duty had been slowly waning. Perhaps it was left there to guide future generations of the Haben family should they wish to return to their positions 
as caretakers of such secrets. The dank air was overpowering at first, so I breathed through my mouth as much as possible to protect me from the rotting stench. Turning the light of my torch to the walls of the cavern, I saw that the roots above had given way to something else. The walls were lined with a strange material, what looked like leaves of intricate metal, perhaps a copper alloy of some kind, though darker. Each leaf was about ten centimeters across, and they were layered on top of each other like the surface of a hedgerow in spring. The metal itself had been inscribed with strange symbols, which I did not recognize. It must have taken years to have created the unusual design. Thousands of metallic leaves, cold and still, in the darkness of time. Thoughts of sunlight were far from my mind. Only the chase mattered. I had to find evidence for my theories about the people of the sea to prove the doubters wrong. How I wish now I had not pushed forward. Up ahead I could see a doorway, the frame made from rock. Beyond that there was a staircase that descended deeper into the earth. This both thrilled and frightened me, for I could feel an unexplained draft of warm air filtering through it, and in the depths somewhere I heard something moving. The closest I can compare it to, from memory, is the sound of an old mill grinding wheat. As I moved down the stone staircase, the walls soon changed from the leaves of intricate metal to a smooth, dark green surface which glistened in the dim light of my torch. It was cool to the touch, but the air was growing even more stifling with each step. The temperature was not the only thing apparent for the draft of it. The movement of the air current was now stronger than before. This was no mere flow of air from one room to another. Something was producing it, pushing it up through the staircase towards me. The grinding noise increased as I reached the bottom of the stairs. My nerves began to get the better of me as I looked toward another doorway. By God, there was light coming from the next room. A yellow light like that given by a candle, but not flickering. I thought that it must be someone else who had happened upon the underground structure before I had. Moving forward, I cautiously asked, "'Who's there?' But there was no reply. Walking through the doorway, I trembled slightly as the light suddenly vanished before I could see its source. The world dimmed in its absence, and so I moved the beam of my torch around to see where I now was. At last, I had found what I had been searching for, the fruit of my work. Though I could not explain the vanishing light, I quickly extinguished that question with awe at what I saw. In the middle of the room, there was a stone altar. Ancient pseudo-Celtic symbols intertwined beautifully across the gray stone, resembling that of a double helix. Upon the altar lay a stone sarcophagus, an ancient coffin beautifully carved out of rock with striking geometric patterns running along its side. Running my hands along its intricately carved exterior, the rectangular sarcophagus felt warm to the touch. The flat lid had inscriptions in a language I didn't recognize, but the carvings at the head of the coffin depicted a huge wave crashing over a complex and advanced city. The residents were fleeing through the streets between tall buildings. It was more evidence to suggest that the lost people from the sea were real, and if my research was correct, that the sarcophagus held the remains of a body washed up on the shores of Little Bernera more than 3,000 years ago. I knew that my discovery would now have to be carefully vetted by a team of archaeologists, so I took some photos on my phone of the stone sarcophagus and readied myself to further study inscriptions on part of the surrounding dark green walls. As I stood there marveling at their artistry and pondering their meaning, I heard something that chilled me to the bone, the sound of stone on stone. I shuddered as I turned, 
and what I saw utterly terrified me. The lid to the sarcophagus had moved. There was now a definite gap exposing the interior and what was contained therein. Call it madness, call it stupidity. Though I was terrified, I had to see what was inside, persuading myself that some unknown mechanism or pressure changed and shifted the stone lid. I walked back to the sarcophagus and peered into the darkness. I expected to see the skeletal remains of an ancient kelp, but what I saw was utterly inhuman and remarkably preserved. Its bleached white skin, if you can call it that, was pulled taut over its sharpened bones. It appeared to me that the eyes had long since rotted away, but the depth of the ocular cavities suggested that it had evolved to see in low-light conditions. The head was elongated slightly, and from its neck there was something protruding. A type of limb was my best guess, one which was utterly unrecognizable to modern science. The rest of the body appeared humanoid in shape. As I peered inside, I puzzled as to how the remains could have still been largely intact. There was no apparatus that I could see, and the sarcophagus was clearly not sealed. On closer inspection, what I had initially thought were empty eye sockets, I soon realized, were the product of some sort of troglodyte process, where a species, perhaps in this case a hominid one, had evolved to lose its eyes as they were a useless resource in the dark. I knew that this was quite common in cave drawings, spiders, and insects, but it had, to my knowledge, never been seen in larger animals. After all, there was very little to sustain larger animals underground. What would they eat? I speculated that the strange protrusion from the neck, which looked almost like a long, thick finger, a knuckle about two feet long, was some sort of sensory organ. This had most probably evolved to replace the loss of sight with a new sense. The face of the thing was repulsive. The nose had receded like a skull, leaving two vacant holes through which to breathe, and the mouth had no teeth at all. In fact, the smoothness and roundness of the mouth made speech, at least through normal means, seemed quite impossible. As I wondered how such monstrous things would have communicated with each other, I noticed that in one of the creature's hands lay a strange object. It was a metallic cube. Though it appeared to be polished metal, no reflection could be seen in its surface, as though the light from the surrounding world had no real impact upon it. And yet I could see it clearly in the dark. Reaching inside, I stretched my arm out and touched the cube with my finger. It was almost in my grasp. As stretched further, my hand brushed against the taut white skin of the body in the stone coffin. I gasped in awe. The skin was warm to the touch, and a wet liquid, which I could only describe as sweat, smeared along the back of my hand. A gasping noise sounded. Lungs, which had not breathed air for an age, wheezed in and out of a toothless, gaping mouth. A smell of rotten seaweed came with it, and I cried out as the thing moved, wrapping its long fingers around my throat. I pulled back with all my might, but the grip was not relinquished. It tightened, and before I knew what was happening, the pallid body pulled me through the small opening into the sarcophagus inside. Our bodies lay together as I tried in vain to scramble out of the stone coffin, but the figure with me lurched its arms upward and pulled the lid back down tightly. I was trapped inside the coffin with the naked, sweating creature. My face was buried in the emaciated cavity of the thing as it wrapped its arms around me and held me close. Then the appendage in its neck, lit by the torch in my hand, moved around like the twitching of a spider's leg, bending at the knuckle. A cracking sound accompanied the movement. From the end of it, the limb, a sharp protrusion, came forward, and the crooked appendage struck toward me. I could barely breathe. The sweating flesh of the thing's body pushed up against my mouth, tasting and smelling of rotten fish and decay. 
Looking up, I watched as the appendage moved towards me. It lunged at my head, and I batted it away with the torch in my hand. Then again, and again. Finally, the creature changed tack, and the sharp protrusion then plunged deep in the back of my hand, cutting straight through and out the other side of my palm. I cried out, yet I knew no one would ever hear me. I was on an island in a remote part of the country, deep underground where no human had any right to be. A slurping noise came, and I finally realized why the thing had no teeth. The appendage in its neck was used to purify the innards of other things so that it could suck the juices dry. I felt something hot inside my hand as the insides were turned into necrotic fluid. The appendage pulled out and then searched for somewhere more succulent. It was in that moment, that brief pause between being eaten alive, that I reached down with my other hand and grabbed the metallic cube. It was now ice cold to the touch and heavy. Lashing out, I thrust the cube into the empty eye cavities of the thing in the sarcophagus, and then nothing. A strange abyss awaited me. The darkness consumed my thoughts momentarily, and I was aware of hideous entities outside of imagination, creatures and intelligence far beyond the rim of understanding. Then a flash of light. I was outside, and the creature was gone, but such a place I had never dreamt of seeing. A strange volcanic landscape revealed itself. Black rocks dotted the world around me, many of them reaching up toward the sky, uneven and worn. My hand was badly injured, and I could no longer move my fingers. The metallic cube was nowhere to be seen. I was utterly alone. Dazed, I walked the solid terrain and found nothing familiar to my eyes. If I had not seen the position of the sun, I would have thought I had been stranded on some unknown distant world. Somehow that metallic cube had sent me to that place, and yet the cube itself did not come along for the ride. At least that horrid thing in the sarcophagus had stayed in its burial chamber and not come with me. Trying to gauge my location, I walked up a steep incline to see the lay of the land. It was then that the true horror of my situation made itself known. Looking down... I could see several vast openings burying into the ground, and deep inside what looked to be deep lakes of seawater. In the mouths of those openings, pale dots moved and writhed. I knew them now to be creatures that had once been described by the ancients as the people of the sea. They seemed to be looking out of their subterranean submerged world, looking to the sky and waiting for the sun to set, when they could once again set foot on land. I laughed to myself. The translation was nearly right. It wasn't of the sea. It was the people in the sea. The same creatures that had been consumed by some cataclysmic event and buried in the Atlantic. One of the survivors had made it to Little Bernera, where no doubt a cult grew up around it. To the early people on the Isle of Lewis, the creature must have been a god or a devil. The tomb that I had entered had obviously been constructed to not only preserve the creature, but somehow sustain it. It had been three days since I arrived here. I now know the truth. The creatures are not gone. They're not temporal. Their land may have been once swept into the Atlantic thousands of years ago, but that eventual end was not their end. I've hypothesized that the metallic cube that sent me here allows the people of the sea to return home whenever they choose. Was the horrid thing in the sarcophagus the last of them in our time? Are there more hidden beings in caves and in darker places of the world? I do not know. But I worry deeply about the future of humanity, for if that thing was a treacherous emissary from the depths of time, it now knows humanity is waiting. I've watched from afar these last few days, 
hidden behind rocky protrusions, watching as the white figures move in and out of the huge openings into the ground and water. It seems they're doing something. There's purpose of sorts. I doubt I shall ever know the true depths of that purpose, unless they find me here and show it to me. But it appears that they're coalescing in number, like an army staging an invasion. I'm nearly out of food and water. I don't think I can last much longer. I've written these notes for those in my time, and I'll seal them inside one of my titanium sample containers. I also have included samples from the ground, this black, lifeless volcanic island that seems to stretch for untold miles. Out there somewhere is the coast of Scotland, as it was thousands of years ago. If only I could see those green shores once more. At night, I hear the creatures chattering among themselves, as they are much more active in the dark. Their voices are like the crumbling rocks and the twitching of an insect's legs. Last night, one nearly found me, but I think I managed to slip away undetected. I think. My strength will leave me soon. I have left details in this container of my loved ones. Please contact them and tell them what befell me. I did not just vanish. Perhaps those who do vanish from the remote places in the world are never gone, but instead find themselves stranded on this piece of hell, floating in the sea. How I would hope for such an outcome, so that I may have human company. I wonder if these worlds will ever be found. If you're reading this, alert the military in Scotland, pass these samples to them, and tell them that on the island of Little Bernera, one of these creatures still lives, hidden underground in a sarcophagus with the means to return home at any time. And yet it did not. What was it waiting for? I hope you enjoyed The People of the Sea by author Michael Whitehouse, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author has an amazing selection of his stories for sale on Amazon.com, including collections of his short stories, and he's also producing a regularly scheduled horror podcast of his own, starring voice actor Peter Lewis, called Fear Noir. To check out more of Mike's work today, go to simplyscarypodcast.com slash whitehouse. Again, that's simplyscarypodcast.com slash whitehouse, and you'll find yourself on his author profile at our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com. On that page, you'll have quick access to his social media links, Amazon profile, and the Fear Noir podcast, with several episodes available now, ready for you to sink your teeth into. And again, if you give any of Michael's works a try, please leave him a review and a kind word, and be sure to let him know you heard about him here on this program, and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. I'd also like to take a moment to thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word it makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and 
have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep if you can. <laughs>